Good afternoon. This is Dr. Ronald Wharton. I am an attending cardiologist at Montefiore Medical Center in the Bronx, New York City, and assistant professor of medicine at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine in the Bronx. I'd like to present you a case that was sent to me recently. This is a 60-year-old woman who has progressive shortness of breath. Uh, over the past several months, she has been able to walk fewer and fewer blocks without getting winded and having to stop. She's having progressive orthopnea. By the time I see her, she's telling me that she's sleeping on three pillows, practices nocturnal dyspnea. Um, her blood pressure is 120 over 70. I will tell you that she's had a previous echocardiogram that demonstrated a certain degree of aortic insufficiency. And there's something else in her medical history that I'm going to omit right now because I think it's better that way and it will keep a little suspense going, as it were. The image you see here is a parasternal long axis window. The left ventricular function, I think you'll agree, is very good. The right ventricle in this view you see, uh, appears to be normal. Uh, you can see that there is some thickening of both the mitral and the aortic valve. When color is placed on it, you can see that there is some mitral regurgitation and an eccentric aortic insufficiency jet. This is a close-up of the parasternal long axis focusing on the left ventricular outflow tract and the aortic valve. And you can see that the aortic valve looks very calcified, somewhat deformed. Here, the color sector is being placed squarely on the left ventricular outflow tract, and you can see that there is some aortic insufficiency. Um, most people, I think, would agree that this is not just mild aortic insufficiency, but at least moderate. It's somewhat eccentric, which can make it a little more difficult to quantify. We now have a M mode through the mitral valve, and Note the uh, AC shoulder or, quote, B bump, unquote, uh, at the uh, end of the uh, uh, A point in the mitral valve M mode. This was a finding that goes back to the beginnings of echocardiography when echo was just M mode uh, and was one of the first ways that echocardiographers could make inferences about physiology from echo the B wave or B bump uh, usually correlates with a high end diastolic pressure, which is certainly consistent with the patient's history of what sounds like progressive symptoms of congestive heart failure. This is a short axis close-up view of the aortic valve. The aortic valve looks very calcified, degenerative, it looks like it's opening. You can't tell exactly how much. We now go to some of the apical windows. Uh, this is an apical four-chamber view, which I show just to demonstrate first that the left ventricular and right ventricular systolic function appear to be normal. Uh, again, the mitral valve appears to be thickened. There may be a little calcification of the posterior mitral annulus, but overall you can see that all of the walls thicken appropriately. And I'm showing you in the next two slides similar, that, that similar inferences about the left ventricular systolic function can be made. First here in the apical two-chamber view, where you can see that everything is thickening quite normally. And again, here in the apical long axis or apical three-chamber view, you can see normal left ventricular systolic function. Here is a color um, sector placed on the apical four-chamber view. You can see that there is some mitral regurgitation, and you can see some of the aortic insufficiency jet coming into the color sector during diastole. Here is an apical long axis view, again, now both in 2D on the left and in color on the right. Now, of course, all aortic insufficiency jets will spread out into the ventricle 
as they get deeper away from the aortic valve. And they can always look more worrisome than they really are. I think most people would agree that this is a respectable aortic insufficiency jet. Here are, is a Doppler of the aortic insufficiency jet. You can see that the Doppler signal is fairly dense. It's not quite as dense as the antegrade jet, although I'm not showing you that here. If one checks the pressure halftime of the aortic insufficiency jet, you get 29% of the deceleration time. And since the deceleration time that's being measured here is 1,200 milliseconds, you can calculate that the pressure halftime of this aortic insufficiency jet is 348 milliseconds which is certainly low, but typically severe aortic insufficiency has a pressure halftime that is lower, typically between 200 and 250 milliseconds. I'm now showing you some views from the suprasternal notch. Uh, this is a color Doppler at the level of the ascending, I'm sorry, of the aortic arch transitioning into the descending thoracic aorta, you can see that there is a pulsatile jet going where it's supposed to. You do not see any color evidence of holodiastolic flow reversal, which is something you would see with aortic insufficiency were it severe. And in the next slide, you can see that the pulse wave Doppler um, of the flow through the descending thoracic aorta confirms what the color Doppler previously shown demonstrated, which is that you have brisk systolic flow with no diastolic reversal at all. Now, this is all important because the patient is really being brought to me asking me, should we replace the aortic valve? That's really the clinical question here is, the aortic insufficiency, the reason that this patient is short of breath and is the right thing to do to send her for a sternotomy and to give her a new aortic valve. The next slide, by the way, we'll, uh, I'm just showing you that uh, there is no appreciable aortic stenosis. The velocity through the aortic valve is about two meters per second. This is now a pulse wave Doppler through the mitral valve. We're back in the apical four chamber view here. What do we see here? We see that the velocity is 1.4 meters per second, a little high, but again, there is some mitral annular calcification, so there could be some trivial um, mitral stenosis causing the velocity through the mitral valve to increase a little bit. But also notice how steep the deceleration time is of the mitral E-wave and how little the atrial contribution is to left ventricular filling when the A-wave a comes in. What do we have so far? We have significant aortic insufficiency, and we have a ventricle that's not particularly dilated. Now, when you have severe aortic insufficiency that's chronic, the left ventricle should be dilated. And if the left ventricle is not dilated and you have acute and you have severe aortic insufficiency, the, the deceleration time should be much steeper. The pulse pressure should be higher, as is true with all cases of aortic insufficiency. Also, though, Acute aortic insufficiency has a very small differential diagnosis. It's almost always either endocarditis or a trauma or a dissection, and this patient has had no evidence of any of the above. So if this aortic insufficiency is acute, the left ventricle being small as it is, she should be a lot sicker than she is. And the left ventricle is not dilated, therefore it's hard to say that the aortic insufficiency is chronic. So what's going on? Well, there are a couple of other clues here. Yes, the aortic valve appears deformed, but also the mitral valve is deformed. And notice that the anterior mitral leaflet looked much thicker than the posterior mitral leaflet. You can see that not only is the filling pattern restrictive, but also the tissue Doppler suggests that this is a restrictive myopathy. Here I'm showing you the tissue Doppler of the lateral mitral annulus where the peak E prime velocity is only 4.9 centimeters 
per second, you could imagine that the sepal velocity would be even lower. So even though aortic insufficiency, were it severe, can cause a restricted filling pattern, it should not affect the tissue Doppler velocities. The fact that the tissue velocities are low suggests that this is not just restrictive filling, but a myopathic process. So what did I omit from the history? This is a patient who many years ago was treated for a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in the chest. She had surgery, but after surgery, she had chest radiation, and radiation techniques decades ago were not nearly as refined as they are right now. There was far more scatter, and frequently the myocardium ended up in the field. Radiation typically is delivered anterior, posterior. Therefore, the leaflets that get involved primarily are the aortic valve leaflets, and the anterior mitral leaflet gets affected more than the posterior leaflet, which is exactly what's being shown here. So the way I put this case together is that this is a patient who has heart failure with preserved ejection fraction because of a restrictive cardiomyopathy due to exposure to radiation. The aortic insufficiency is not a culprit here. It is a victim of the radiation, just as the myocardium is. And the right thing to do is to treat her for congestive heart failure with diuretics and make her feel better, but to not send her for aortic valve surgery. I hope you enjoyed this case as much as I did, and thanks for listening.